Hello. Uh, so we will have uh, the first and the, and the only talk of this afternoon uh, by Professor Vasilev, who will be telling us about Coxeter higher spin theories and strings to tensor models. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation to this wonderful institute and a very interesting meeting. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm grateful too for the, giving me an opportunity to give a talk here. So I will be talking about two uh, recent papers, one from last month, another one from today, uh, mostly about this new class of higher spin theories, which I believe are related to string theory and more generally to their further extensions related to the um, holographically duals of tensor models, whatever they are. So, um, uh, during this talk, I, I have a rather extended plan, which is shown here. It's more or less two slides per, per item here. So, what is shown in green is a kind of introduction to the standard things that were available before, for many years mostly. The red ones are new items, that the new results that I'm going to present. And the rest is just small discussion of uh, sometimes important points, of course. So the main feature, I will explain all these uh, th things in, during my talk, but the main point is that what I'm going to present is some extension of the standard class of higher spin gauge theories. And this is related to Coxeter groups and uh, another related object in math is called Chervidnik algebra, so I'll explain what it is. So, uh, uh, to begin with, let me just uh, start with very general motivation for why it, it can be interesting or should be interesting to study higher spin gauge theories. Um, basically, the story is about symmetries. So, we know that higher spin gauge theories, as well as any other gauge th theory, exhibit some symmetries, and the natural question to ask is uh, what would happen if we would assume that at some super high energies, maybe above the Planck scale, uh, some higher symmetries will show up. And that is, of course, related to the question that was addressed many years ago, like 30 years ago, by David Gross and uh, asking what could be a symmetric phase of string theory. And basically, the point is that whatever it is, if it exists, then it should be one or another version of uh, higher spin gauge theory, because these are theories exhibiting these large symmetries. So the point is what they are, and uh, how they are organized. So the story is quite long, actually, and uh, uh, there were some preliminary important papers. Mostly no-go statements were formulated that such theories cannot exist. But then it was realized that if one would change background from flat to anti de Sitter, then actually the story becomes interesting and these theories can be developed and constructed. And uh, since then, uh, the theory is developing. And the models that we do know these days are such as that they are formulated in uh, anti de Sitter as a most symmetric background. Of course, not necessarily anti de Sitter, but this is the most symmetric background that one can choose. And these theories contain infinite towers of spins, of gauge fields, massless spins, uh, from zero to infinity. Actually, fermions are also allowed, but in this talk, I will be talking about bosons for simplicity. And this pattern somehow is reminiscent of the uh, pattern of the first rigid trajectory in string theory. So, the, uh, what is different from string theory are mostly two points. First is the background is ADS, uh, and second is that the pattern of fields is far smaller than in full-fledged string theory. <clears throat> so, that raises the question how these models can be related, and I hope that this uh, work clarifies at least where to go to, to, to look at more direct relation. So the question, of course, was addressed many times in the literature, and recently there was a very important progress uh, due to Matthias and, uh, and Rajesh, uh, 
in the last four, year, four or five years. Also, I also had some conjecture, which, as I will explain today, was not quite correct, but I know how to correct it now this, these days. So it looks like that, indeed, there is a chance to understand string theory, the spontaneously broken higher spin theory, and the answer is somewhere around the corner. So that's, um, these days, I think, have good chances to make progress relatively soon. So this is mostly the aim of this talk, to explain one possible way towards this goal. Uh, to begin with, let me just remind you some very basic facts about higher spin gauge theories that one can deduce from almost nothing, and these are quite important. So, uh, massless fields were, in the full generality, considered by Fronsdal in 78, even though the particular examples were considered by many people, including Schwinger, far earlier. So, the main feature is that these fields in the, fl in the flat space or AD, they are gauge fields. So, that's what makes them interesting. So, they have abelian gauge symmetries at the free field level, and the main problem is what would be a non-abelian extension and what would be an interacting theory compatible with that extension. But even looking at this formula, one can deduce some rather uh, important uh, features of this theory, and, uh, which immediately show you that what we are talking about is rather far away from usual low energy theories we are used to. Because the point is that these parameters, they are tensors of higher ranks for higher spins. And this simply means that they should transform as tensor with, uh, under the Lorentz, uh, Lorentz rotations. And in ADS also, uh, ADS transvections, uh, ADS translations, also affect the uh, higher spin generators. So this way of reading this relation is pre rather trivial. But if I would read it other way around, which means that higher spin transformations, when they act on space-time symmetries, they produce higher spin transformations, that immediately tells you that higher spin gauge fields, uh, sorry, that gauge fields associated with space-time symmetries, and this is actually a metric tensor, are not invariant in presence of higher spin gauge symmetries. So higher spin gauge symmetries, they do transform spin two to some higher spin field. This means that actually the usual concepts of Riemannian geometry are not applicable if higher spin symmetries are unbroken. And that immediately tells us that these theories are somewhat unusual and probably non-local in the standard sense, because having no concept of metric means that we can't measure a distance between two nearby points, and that is an indication that actually this is a wrong concept. So that is somehow immediate consequence that the resulting theory should not necessarily be non-local, uh, be local. And um, one of the hot topics these days is to understand to which extent it is non-local, and uh, whether one can formulate um, higher spin theories in a frame where this non-locality is somehow minimal in certain sense. And this is what we are studying now, and uh, this is one of the important issues. So that was uh, realized by many authors during the years, so some progress uh, was made just uh, um, in, in the last couple of years and uh, in the recent paper as well, and in the forthcoming paper as well. Okay, so we can't use Riemannian geometry probably. That simply means that if we would introduce metric tensor, it will be one gauge field among an infinite tower of gauge fields. All, they were, all of them will be mixed by these symmetries, so it doesn't just make much sense to single out this particular member. But on the other hand, uh, we want to keep diffeomorphisms invariant, so to keep the equivalence principle and gravity, uh, whatever it is, this higher spin gravity, as people say now. So to achieve this, one should use some formalism that um, guarantees diffeomorphism invariance without explicit reference to the metric tensor. And of course, there is such a formalism is formalism of differential forms. So the idea is that it is very useful to formulate the whole story in terms of first order like formulations, like Hamiltonian dynamics, if you like, when every, uh, there is a set of variables which are differential forms, W here, 
And exterior uh, derivative of every of these W fields is again expressed in terms of the same set of fields. This is like in Hamiltonian dynamics when time derivative of every variable is expressed in terms of uh, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, expressed in terms of the same set of variables. So, indeed, it turns out that this way is very useful to a reformulating system. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much time to discuss details. It's, it's very interesting mathematically and from many, many different perspectives. Uh, one point that I would like to emphasize is that one, once one is looking at some uh, unfolded form of dynamical equations for some system, then uh, there is a compatibility condition that d squares to zero. And that means that g is not at all arbitrary. It should obey some, as a function of w, it should obey some compatibility conditions which actually are analogous to Bianchi identities in field theory. And they are Bianchi identities related to gauge symmetries. Okay, so very briefly, what is most important in my talk today is that uh, this approach is actually very general. It does not mean that any restriction on the particular model, every model can be reformulated this way. Uh, it keeps manifest higher spin or general gauge symmetries, and in this case, higher spin gauge symmetries, as well as diffeomorphism invariance due to the language of differential forms. And another rather peculiar feature is that once one has some equations in this form and the function g indeed obey these conditions, then actually it doesn't matter so much which particular original space time with the local coordinates x was chosen. You can add coordinates or subtract coordinates and your system basically will be equivalent one to another. And that has a lot to do with holography actually. This is the way how one can identify holographically dual systems just by unfolding these equations. In particular, this way one can easily see that a klebanov polikov conjecture on the holography between three-dimensional sigma models and four-dimensional Hirschman theory can be just realized and seen rather explicitly. To some extent, not fully at this, moment, at this stage, because this is a classical description, but a lot is seen. Okay. Uh, so in these terms, uh, when one describes some system which exhibits some H symmetry, which is a Lie algebra, then the background, the vacuum, is described in terms of flat connections of this group uh, associated with this uh, symmetry H. So the background is described in, by Maurer Cartan like equations like this. And this way, for instance, one can describe Antidecitor or Poincare, depending on which algebra you choose as space time symmetry algebra. But what is uh, very important is that in this language, the equations for matter fields, for any excitations for linearized uh, deviations from the vacuum, is uh, getting the form of covariant constancy conditions. So when one try to write down some equations in the unfolded form, which are linear in some field like C here, then what one is left is the equation like this, and the compatibility condition actually will tell you that this set of field C forms some module of, of your algebra H, and covariant derivative is just given in this model. Okay. So in this language, uh, massless equations for four-dimensional fields can be very uniformly described uh, in terms of two fields, omega and C. Omega is a one form, C is a zero form. That depend on auxiliary commuting spinorial variables y and y bar. So that is an expansion, expansion in powers of these commuting variables. Alpha is a two-component spinner in four dimensions. So it turns out that the full uh, infinite tower of massless fields is packed naturally in terms of these two objects, uh, omega and C. Omega is for gauge fields, and C is for gauge invariant tensors like wild tensor and also for metal fields. The whole set of equations has this very simple form with star and st st equations marked by stars. So the first one tells us that almost all components of the higher spin curvatures are zero except for those that are parameterized by the uh, field C holomorphic and anti-holomorphic component of the field C in Y and Y bar, respectively. Uh, 
So the meaning of these objects is just that they are higher spin analogs of the wild tensor in gravity. And in, in the spin two case, this equation would tell you that all components of the Riemann tensor, linearized Riemann tensor, are zero, except for those that can be associated with the wild tensor, which is equivalent way to say that we are considering Einstein equations. Everything is zero except for while, which means Ricci is zero. So the same way it works for all higher spins. And uh, then one can continue considering uh, compatibility condition for this Bianchi identity, and that results in some covariant constancy equation on the field C, which uh, I would like to show more explicitly, uh, mostly because of this term given in red, which is very important from the perspective of the analysis of locality. So the equation on C contains second derivatives in the y variables. And basically it tells us that d dy d dy bar is at the linearized level the same as d dx. So <clears throat> this reformulation in the first order unfolded form maps the whole story of x space to the uh, story in the twister-like space of y variables. And actually, we know that derivatives in y are related to derivatives on x by these field equations. This means that all these additional components containing in CYY bar are expressed in terms of space-time derivatives of the uh, primary components, which are given here by C uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. Pretty much like in conformal field theory. Okay, that is important. Let's remember that, that uh, analyzing locality in Y space is equivalent to analyzing locality in X space. And basically we will do that uh, in this talk a little bit. All right, so now, now let me immediately explain what is the higher spin algebra uh, in these terms. This follows from the construction that I presented, because the construction is given in terms of functions of y and y bar, and that immediately tells us that higher spin symmetry should be given in terms of parameters which are functions of y and y bar, because these parameters should be associated with this one-form gauge field. So what the algebra is? Well, it is. Uh, it was uh, found uh, long ago by very different means, and uh, actually those days we didn't realize that there is such a simple way to understand what it is. But basically, the point is that this algebra is something like while algebra for non-commutative uh, oscillators y and y bar, which means that now the commutator is proportional to a C number, which is epsilon symbol, because indices alpha and beta take two values. So here I'm using the language of star product, instead of using the language of operators, which means that I could put heads over y's, but I prefer to put star because I will use this language later on, but they're completely equivalent at this level of analysis. So we know this algebra for usual higher spin symmetry, and uh, we know that the pattern of this higher spin symmetry is a little bit too limited. So the question is how to go beyond this pattern. And the naive way is just to, why don't we take more spinners, more oscillators, then our fields will get more components, and maybe taking the infinitely many new spinners, we will be able to describe uh, some string-like theory. And this naive way does not work for a reason that actually uh, is rather trivial, so everybody we were discussing in this field that why don't we try to do this, but somehow this attempt immediately fails for the following reason. Uh, if we are now uh, learning the lessons from holography, we now can consider the boundary part of the story. So from the boundary side, the module associated with this higher spin symmetry is precisely given by the free fields in two plus one dimensions. One can analyze uh, weights of the dilatation operator find some weights for, say, Fock vacuum in that space, with these oscillators. And this module precisely uh, is appropriate for the holography with the higher spin gravity, uh, which means that if one considers tensor product of these two guys, 
then there are massless fields on the right-hand side, and in particular, graviton. If, however, we just let more oscillators be involved, then what will happen is that these weights will be increasing, roughly speaking, proportional to the number of oscillators P. So, and that would immediately uh, give an, uh, the following consequence, that uh, these modules, the tensor product, will have no room for spin two massless fields, which means that there is no graviton in this picture if we'll try to do this. And that is not what we are going to consider. So, uh, uh, if we just naively would try to let more oscillators be around, this uh, gives a uh, wrong result, and that is what uh, we are living with for many, many years. So, the point is that there is a way to avoid this difficulty, which is rather trivial, but to realize that uh, actually it came from, again, from the holography side. I have no time to explain how we arrived at it, but basically that is a lesson from the idea of safety correspondence. So the point is that the situation improves immediately if one would slightly modify the basic commutation relations of the usual oscillator algebras. So the usual oscillator algebra is given by these commutators, which tell us that commutator of oscillators is a constant. And what one should do, one should associate it different constant-like or unit-like operators with different species of these oscillators. So what I'm doing here, I'm saying that this is not the same uh, identity operator, but there are different identity-like operators, I, N, which are at importance, which are for forming a center of the algebra. And if we do that, then the problem is immediately resolved. For, for, for this oscillator algebra, one can immediately see that the original module associated with the single oscillator, then it actually forms a module of this extended algebra as well, which means that massless higher spin fields now will be represented by the uh, representations of this algebra. So this is simply because one can demand that all these side importance don't really act only on the appropriate fork vacuum by this formula, and all others give zero. It's very simple. Okay, so that gives a hope that we can proceed along these lines further, and indeed we do. But to explain how it works, I should say a few words about uh, uh, the, the full nonlinear higher spin equations. Uh, so, to describe full nonlinear system of higher spin equations, one should extend the system a little bit by adding more variables analogous to y which are called z here, so we double the z variables. The meaning of this is, um, well, there are several meanings, but practically the, what happens is that introducing the z variables makes it much easier to analyze nonlinear corrections to equations. This mathematically corresponds to some spectral sequence that maps difficult homological problem in the x space to a very simple one in the z space. And that is how it works in practice. Or other way around, one can say that, you know, this is something similar to special functions which are defined by equations rather than power series expansion that allows you to deduce their properties much easier. So it is useful to introduce these z variables and impose equations that determine the z dependence in a proper way, uh, showing that they are consistent, and that allows one to reconstruct nonlinear corrections order by order. So, in the end of the day, the story is formulated in terms of initial data, which means values of these fields at the vanishing value of z, and that are original fields omega and c that uh, I have shown in a couple of slides before. So, in this uh, construction, there are actually two types of fields, and this is important. There are dynamical fields, which are massless fields, associated with the usual spin 1, spin 2, spin 3, and so on. But there are also infinitely many, <clears throat> there is infinitely many topological fields, such that each of them carries just a finite number of degrees of freedom. But the tower of these fields is also infinite. So 
these fields usually are discarded in the standard analysis of higher spin gauge theory, and I will not consider them in this talk in detail. They can be truncated away in the simplest vacuum uh, solutions, but they actually do play a very important role in the theory because they describe somehow modules of the theory, and they show up in the analysis of black, hole and black holes in this theory, and so on. So one should not forget about these fields in the general situation. Okay. So, a uh, Klein operator that is shown here is just an operator that uh, produces a reflection changing a sign of left spinners in this particular realization. So, it is important to introduce, to distinguish between a joint and twisted joint module, uh, which appeared in the linearized higher spin equations I presented. So, uh, the full system is actually formulated in a very compact way, so one should introduce star product now. And now is the first time when I really identify the star product I'm using. So this is rather uh, standard construction. This is just normal order star product with respect to z plus minus y. Again, this is a z, uh, what is called while algebra, which means algebra of oscillators. And in this uh, star product, there are so-called inner Klein operators that also change the sign of left spinners and right spinners, but among z and y only. So this system of equations, it contains two parts. So the first part, given in black here, is the one that contains the x derivatives. And this is the only place where space-time derivatives appear. The other two, given in the red, they have no space-time differentials, they are fully uh, formulated in the twister space, where star product has. By twister space, I mean zy space, which is not 100% precise, precisely the twister space, but let me use this uh, terminology just a little bit abusing them. Um, okay, so this is rather interesting because the only non-trivial equation here is the last one. The last one tells us that S star S, which is actually non commutative uh, non-commutative curvature for the connection S in the z-space. Contains some simple term which just tell us that this is a non-commutative connection plus corrections. These corrections actually mean that there is a non-trivial curvature, very specially organized, and this is from where all non-trivial dynamics comes out. So these two terms actually uh, produce non-trivial uh, and non-linear dynamics in the end, such that after solving these equations, one reconstructs space-time equations in space-time. But the lesson is that the whole story is actually formulated in the twister space, in these equations given in red. The other equations, practically, they perform kind of non-linear extension of Penrose transform from the twister space to space-time. So this is how it is organized. It was rather surprising to see that equations was possible to formulate this way. And of course, the most interesting part is what is special about this deformation. Actually, it has many important interpretations and meanings, and it is not at all easy to uh, extend it or modify. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have much time to explain all details, but let me tell what is most important for in the context I'm going to tell you about today. So, this deformation is related to what is, in, in math, is known as Chernik algebra. I will explain, I will give a definition very soon. So, Chernik algebra can be associated with any uh, Coxeter group. And this particular realization is just the simplest case where one chooses Z2 as a Coxeter group. So, this is just the simplest possible uh, deformation along these lines. It turns out that one can extend this deformation to any uh, Cherednik algebra or to any Coxeter algebra. Okay. All right. So, a couple of words about perturbative analysis at locality just to uh, advertise the recent results on this issue. So, to analyze the system perturbatively, one should start with some vacuum. And there is a very simple vacuum 
setting b to zero means that these all two, two terms go, and one is left with flatness conditions which can be easily solved by this s naught field and w naught field, provided that w naught obeys this flatness condition, and this is actually nothing else as the equation for ADS4. So this is from where ADS4 comes out in this language. It comes from the star product. Uh, well, and then one can see that commutator with S0 produces the RAM di differential with respect to Z variables. So the whole story of solving this equation is basically the story of solving equations like this, that the Z of some unknown function F is expressed in terms of a variable function g. So how to solve these equations? This is very, sim very easy and very well known how to do this. So one can just explicitly write solution to this equation in terms of summary solution that I will specify in a moment, plus homogeneous solutions that is, can contain dz exact terms and homologies of the RAM differential, dz. So the way how one finds the solution is the following. One should introduce some homotopy, and the simplest homotopy operator that squares to zero is given by this formula, and then immediately one can find the full solution to the problem with the resolution operator given by this simple formula. So that is very explicit way of solving higher spin equations. So plugging in the solution to the space-time-like equations, one ends up with the deformation of the space-time field equations. However, it was realized in the, basically in the first paper by John Benin, where they were checking uh, klebanov polikov conjecture, they found that uh, in some sectors, it is difficult to compute. Difficult means that the computation actually contains divergences that are hard to work with. And they concluded that this is a consequence of some non-locality in the higher spin theory. And then this issue was analyzed further by these people and also by myself. And indeed, the conclusion was that if one would use this particular homotopy, then the result in the certain sectors becomes non-local, essentially non-local. And that's what makes it difficult to analyze holography and as well as dynamics, as well as black holes. So that becomes a problem. So the new <clears throat> way of solving this problem was just found very recently, and that is very, very simple. Uh, namely, what one should do, one should use slightly different uh, homotopy, where z is shifted to some by th some operator q that commutes to ddz, which is z-independent. One can, of course, use any shifted z equally well with the original z multiplication. So basically, the trick is that one can use operators like this, as q, where derivatives are derivatives with respect to the arguments of the fields. And uh, it turns out that there is a choice of Q that not only leads to the local results in the approximation that, for instance, Jeremy and Ian were using, but also actually allows to uh, prove a theorem uh, that it decreases non-locality in all higher orders as well. So this is just the shown in this paper that was posted today. Uh, so that's, I would like to emphasize that the issue of locality is actually uh, probably, um, it, I wouldn't say it's completely understood, for instance, we still don't know whether the higher spin theory is actually spin local, as we say. This means that if we consider vertices with the given set of spins, then in terms of y variables, it may well happen that the result is completely local, so there are, there are no non-localities at all, which does not mean that it is local in X space. But, I mean, this, not all questions are realized, but now we can actually compute order by order many things that were not available before. All right. So, and next is, uh, I would like now to move to this extension that uh, goes beyond the standard higher spin equations. Uh, so, let me first recall you a little bit what are Coxeter groups and what are Cherudnik algebras. So, Coxeter group is C is a very simple object. So, 
Suppose you have some vector space, which is p-dimensional, and you have some set of reflections in this vector space with respect to some set of root vectors. So vectors with respect to which reflections is done is called root vector. So there is a set of root vectors, and you just do usual reflection with respect to the particular vector in the Euclidean space. So Coxeter group is a group generated by such reflections, and which is finite. So the classification of Coxeter group, groups is known for many, many years, in particular all uh, wild groups of uh, simple Lie algebras belong to this list, and not only that. Uh, and the concept that appeared more recently is the Cherednik algebra, or Cherednik deformation of the oscillator algebra. Let me explain that. That is very interesting, and that is actually appears in very different context. In particular, this is what is related to such integrable system as Calogero model. So one can think of the Cherednik algebra as the algebra of observables of the Calogero model. That is more or less the same story. So that's uh, our equivalent objects. And now it is very hot topic in math, by the way. People are studying these deformations. So let me explain what they are. So suppose you have some set of oscillators called Q here. So alpha takes two values as before. It's, you can think of a two component spinner, for instance. But n is just a color index. Okay? And this index is, refers to the vector space where root vectors are living. So now introduce an operator, Klein like operator, K, that is defined so that when one commutes, commutes is with the Q oscillator, then it just produces a reflection. So when you move through, it just produces a reflection of the vector Q. R is a reflection matrix that appears here. So consider oscillator algebra, semi-direct direct product with the group algebra uh, of the Coxeter group. And these are Ks and all their combinations and add such a term to the commutation relations of the original oscillators. Well, the resulting algebra will be called Cherednik algebra, and here there is a coupling constant or a constant, a parameter, nu. So nu uh, is not necessarily constant, it should be a constant with respect to the ac action of the Coxeter group, which means that nu may depend on your root vectors, but in a very special way, so that it is a constant on every conjugacy class of the uh, Coxeter group. So in principle, there may be several constants, and just uh, may, may be, uh, as advertising what will happen with Hirsch, in the Hirschman case, there will be two coupling constants in the generalized Hirschman theories. One is the same as in the usual Hirschman theory, another actually of string-like, stringy kind of. Uh, coupling constant that produces effects to be associated with string theory. Okay, so what is most important is that these relations, uh, they obey Jacobi. I mean, that's if you consider triple double commutator and permute indices, Jacobi will be automatically satisfied. This is a very, very non-trivial uh, situation which actually is very hard to achieve. So that's why you can consider a kind of universal enveloping algebra of that, and this is the Cherednik algebra by definition. Okay? Okay. So, uh, uh, let me explain in some more detail what is a particular case of BP Coxeter system. So this is one particular class, the same B as in classification of uh, Lie algebras. So in this case, in the p-dimensional space, there are two types of reflections. One reflection just reflects every axis in this space. Another permutes the axis. So this is the uh, elementary uh, uh, reflections that form, generate this BP algebra. And there are two uh, conjugacy classes. One is just of elementary reflections of axes, and the, the other one is generated by permutations. Well, 
what I'm going to tell you about is that the Coxeter group of the, say, three-dimensional higher spin theory is just B1. But if we extend it to B2, we will arrive at somewhat far more general and rich theory that is conjectured to be associated with string theory. A remarkable feature of the uh, Chirinik algebras is that they have inner sp2 automorphisms generated by anti-commutators of these oscillators q and the commutation relations for these generators are insensitive to the chiridnik deformation so it's clearly that there is sp2 generated by usual oscillators but even if you add these additional terms then actually the commutation relations do not change this sp2 has a meaning of Lorentz symmetry in particular in the higher spin theory, so this play a very important role. Okay, so what remains is to now extend this frame, uh, the, uh, this Chirinik system to the framed algebra by uh, adding this idempotence like y. And this turns out in the end very simple. One just, cho just should replace the Klein operators by Klein operators times this at importance y and n and ym, that is no longer a group algebra, but it is a consistent algebra anyway. So, and then one can uh, uh, introduce the framed Chirinik algebra that allows one to resolve those problems I mentioned with the wrong spectral fields in the naive, naive approach. Okay, so then what remains is to generalize a little bit the star product by incorporating this add importance into the star product, which is very straightforward and not a big deal at all. And one can see that there is a room for inner coxeter Klein operators that generate elementary coxeter uh, collections uh, through the star product. And in the end, one can now write down the coxeter higher spin equations. And that is the model that I believe has, uh, well, will have a rich field of applications. So basically, as you remember, there was only one equation that was non-trivial in the nonlinear uh, higher spin system. Let me come back to that. Oops. That was, oops. This one. So everything else remains as it was. But this gets deformed, so let me come to its deformation. Uh, uh, here it is. So simply one uh, performs summation over all, all root vectors in the system. The parameters nu of v are now replaced by this function star product of b, and they again are demanded to be constant to be uh, only dependent on the conjugacy class, classes of the Coxeter group. Uh, these kappas are Klein operators that only affect differentials to z. And that's end of story. That's, I say that what, 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 what ends up is a huge class of higher spin like theories associated with any Coxeter group. So particularly, what is interesting is to consider a model that is associated with the BP groups, BP uh, Coxeter groups, and it contains, as I mentioned, two conjugacy classes, which means that there are two coupling constants or even functions of B, F1 and F2. So F1, as before, just changes the sign of particular axis, which means in these terms of particular direction in this N space, but F2 permutes, and that actually has a very dramatic consequence for the model. Uh, what one can see immediately is that equations for this system at the linearized level still contain all massless fields around. So the graviton is there as well as all massless fields. But there, on the top of that, there is a lot more. So let me now uh, briefly uh, discuss First, what can one do more? And second, what are consequences from the, say, string theory 
perspective. Uh, well, there is an interesting story about this that equations of this type, they are associated with what is called sometimes A infinity structures. So that means that if one let all fields be valued in arbitrary associative algebra, then the system remains perfectly consistent. And this is true for the equations I presented. So the number one extension is just to let uh, all fields carry matrix indices, and keeping in mind that there should be some relation that is anticipated, some relation with the tether models, actually what one can do, one can let these indices be associated with rank P tensors for the uh, rank P Coxeter group. Well, another is that one can not necessarily consider simple uh, Coxeter groups. One can consider some products of the Coxeter groups, and even infinite products of the Co Coxeter groups make sense to consider. And if we consider infinite product of uh, Coxeter group, and also consider symmetri symmetrized elements of this product, then uh, as a result, we find some very interesting algebra, which I call multiparticle algebra, and this algebra is actually universal enveloping of the uh, higher spin algebra associated with the original Coxeter group. It is a Hopf algebra. And actually, this is the algebra that is conjectured to be related to string theory. And um, for, there are several reasons that this infinite uh, limit of the number of algebra is important. OK. Uh, now let me explain what happens if you allow these additional structures. Well, there is some, what emitted dramatic effect on the uh, space of states in this system. So normally in higher spin symmetry uh, theory, you have these fields like C of Y. Now going to rank two, we have at P equal two, we have two copies of Y variables. Uh, you can multiply these objects and depending on whether or not there is a Klein operator involved in this product, what can happen are two things. First, if there is a Klein operator, then what will happen is that it will permute y1 and y2. And you will get a product cy1, y2, star cy2, y1. That can be continued, so one can get a string of product of fields with successively permuted arguments. That is very much like in the matrix product. You multiply matrices, the first with the second, and so on and so forth. And this string of operators, string of fields, is pretty much like a single trace operator in ads Okay. On the other hand, if this, and this operator is new, K12 is what indeed distinguishes between the B2 system and B1. There was no room for such operator in the uh, original higher spin symmetry where there was only a single set of oscillators. So, uh, for instance, so there are single trace operators like C original and this guy, and there are double trace like operators where C is just multiplied by itself. So that is the spectrum of operators that one can uh, analyze, and in fact it is enormously richer than the spectrum of operators in the original higher spin symmetry uh, theory. Uh, yes. So, <clears throat> uh, the conjecture is that uh, because the spectrum of B2 higher spin model is somewhat analogous to string theory with infinite no set now of rigid trajectories, this particular B2 higher spin theory, or better to say multiparticle B2 higher spin theory, is going to be related, is conjectured to be related to full-fledged string theory. And indeed, it has a lot of similarities with uh, uh, models considered by Gabardil and Gopakumar um, that were presented in, in, in this meeting by Matthias <coughs> a couple of days ago. So in particular, it has, because it has two species of oscillators, this means that it has kind of two uh, non-trivially uh, related higher spin subalgebras in this construction. That is very much similar to what we learned from these authors. Well, if we consider larger Coxeter groups, 
then all of them, starting from p equal 2, have these two coupling constants. So as I already mentioned, f1, the coupling constant of the first type, are just the same as in the higher spin theory, but f2 first appears in the rank 2 stringy theory, and then it actually permutes different y's, so allowing to distinguish between single, par single trace and double trace operators. Well, of course, the model that I presented is not quite the usual string theory. It's not in a flat space. And uh, there is an issue how to relate it to string theory, which is most important issue for now. One of the points is that one should probably consider a certain limit in terms of this coupling constant. So the proper limit seems to be that F2 to F1 should be infinite, such that the stringent effect permuting the arguments would be dominating. Well, if you would go to higher P, then what will happen is that you will have more arguments, and they all will be permuted by these Klein operators, so naively it will look like a mess, but in practice the uh, interaction terms are very special, and then uh, actually that is not a mess at all. So all these additional terms were permuted arguments, which uh, are can be seen from the boundary picture, then they, they show up here. Okay, any questions so far? Hello. Uh, so, this, what is the physical interpretation of these coxeter uh, systems? Uh, for example, there are these non-abelian um, higher spin things which uh, people have proposed uh, that it, it is a thing that confines to give the dual of the ABJM model. Um, Sheehan and Shiraz and so on and so forth, they at some point wrote a paper. Is it somehow related to that? Or? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's not directly because there is an issue of uh, spontaneous breakdown of symmetries. I'll come to that. I mean, and this is completely not clear at the moment. Hopefully, yes. I mean, that's, and hopefully this is B2 uh, system, but that has not been analyzed. Yes. Uh, I mean, they, they would commute to one another in absence of the Klein operators, but because there are Klein operators, the whole structure is non-commutative. So and, it's and not a direct product. And But do they intersect? I mean, uh, the intersection of these two algebras, is this some subalgebra? Well, if, you, if you just um, take away the Klein operators, then it will be just commutative structures. It's like two oscillators which don't know each, uh, anything about each other. But there are operators in the construction that permute these objects, and that makes the whole, the, whole, the whole story actually simple. But can you describe the full algebra in terms of representations of uh, one of them, or the other of them, or both of them? Uh, I mean, the full D algebra, if it contains a subalgebra, you can write it as a subalgebra plus the representations with respect to this subalgebra. Yeah, I hope so, yes. That should be doable, but I mean, uh, yeah, I think so, yes. I mean, then one could really see whether this looks similar to the sort of construction we found from the symmetric orbifold, because we got a very specific class of representations appearing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree. It would be interesting to see. I mean, uh, as I say, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's pretty analogous to what you have found. But I, I didn't, I wasn't able, I mean, not because it was difficult, but because I had no time to and uh, just analyze the structure of representation from that perspective so far. I mean, in our case, the two algebras basically intersect on the graviton, but are otherwise don't commute with one another. And they basically generate the full, the full set of uh, generators by recursively applying one or the other of them. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean... Uh, so it would be very interesting to see if, 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 that, if that was uh, visible in your construction. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, Well, there are actually, well, uh, it's, uh, I mean, the, the story may be more tricky, actually, because in this algebra, algebras, Cherudnik algebras that are studied, there are sometimes some non-trivial ideas, ideals. And the point is that what can happen is that you start with this algebra, and then maybe to make contact with the, your construction, one should quotient out some ideals that make the make story rather non-trivial. I mean, this is actually what mathematicians are studying now, so just take Cherudnik algebra and see for which values of these coupling constants some null states appear, some ideals appear. 
And in particular, in this case, in the B2 case, there is a result telling us that the, if the two coupling constants are specially related, not independent, then there is an ideal that can be uh, quotient out. So that may be actually important point to, to make contact in particular. It cannot be excluded, I would say. BP, uh, I, I believe that BP should correspond to uh, higher spin models somehow dual to what is called tensor models now. That uh, these are sigma models containing with the field phi carrying several indices, not one. And then they have a lot more of, of uh, uh, the spectrum is much richer. Actually, the Hagedorn is zero in those models. And I, it looks like that these are the models that should be somehow could do dual to, to, to the tensor models at the boundary. But I mean, from a string perspective, you would expect that the, the stringy spectrum is, uh, in some sense, as large as it goes. It, 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 no, the, the, they have larger spectrum. The, 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 the bulk duals of tensor models, they have far larger spectrum than string theory. I mean, the Hagedorn is zero. I mean, it's uh, just uh, it blows up immediately. Uh, so. But, uh, these, uh, these algebras need to use Coxeter groups. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the Sharonic algebras people have talked about even in things which are not uh, Coxeter, but general, more generalized reflections, complex reflection groups. Uh, well, there are extensions indeed. Uh, there are extensions which are called symplectic reflections, for instance. Um, as far as I understand, they are less relevant to this problem for the particular property that is lost in those contexts. What is lost is this sp2 covariance of the algebra. sp2, it becomes SL2C in the four-dimensional models, which is Lorentz. It would be very uh, unlucky to, to, to get it lost. So this is what happens in those extensions, probably. That's why they don't look so much. But formally, you can consider those as well. And maybe they will, may have some meaning, I mean, as some particular solutions or deformations or whatever. So, so can you describe the spin spectrum of these algebras? I mean, how many fields of which spin, how does it grow with the spin, the number of fields? Uh, well, uh, the, the, the short answer is that no, I, I cannot now describe that. But uh, in fact, it's not that simple answer because even I don't, uh, I would prefer to, 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 to maybe to answer a bit later because I will, it's not, non-trivial question is in how many dimensions we live, number one. It's not even clear that. I mean, the, the, I, I said that I formulated those models. The, I didn't say anything how many axes are there. And this is actually a little bit um, non-trivial problem now because you can view these models differently. You can view them as 10-dimensional models with brains of lower dimensions, or you can view them as three-dimensional models or four-dimensional models embedded somewhere else. So when you talk about spin, one should specify what kind of spin you mean. I mean, that's... True, but I mean, the, the growth behavior as a function of the spin will probably not be affected much by whether you think of it, I mean, it, it would then be the dimension reduction from 10 dimension down to 4 dimensions, so that would produce a yeah, finite I mean, uh, if additional it's multiplicity. Huge in one model, then it will be huge in another. That's, uh, I mean, yeah, so the question is, how does the, the number of fields per spin grow with the spin? Does it grow linearly or quadratic or exponential or...? Uh, I would refrain from, I, I'm, uh, I must say, I don't know, so that's... Uh, I mean, I'm that, not saying it's uh, really uh, impossible to, to answer, but uh, I didn't analyze. I mean, I mean, that would be interesting to analyze because that will also tell you whether it has a chance to correspond to string theory. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, uh, indeed. I mean, Rajesh asked me a month ago uh, I mean, about partitions. This is an absolutely proper question that I still have no answer because I was busy with something else. But I will. Yeah. Okay. So let me just uh, finish what I wanted to... Okay, so there is some extension of this construction, which I will very briefly mention. It allows one to uh, consider a larger or more general systems if there are some projectors at importance in the original star product algebras, whatever they are. So one can consider larger setup with these projectors involved. And actually, actually what comes out of that is that this is a twister like way for describing some objects that are supporting fields of lower dimensions. So these are like brains 
uh, in string theory. So if you uh, consider one or another set of projectors, then the set of de uh, de number of degrees of freedom of fields associated with this projector becomes lower. And actually, this means that the space-time interpretation of this system actually has lower dimension. There are two examples which are very simple to analyze. One is in the original B1 system, and this is just the Fock projector in the terms of star product. Then one can see that that precisely corresponds to the klebanov polikov picture in ads 4 cft 3 So the fields living generated from these projectors are two plus one dimensional conformal fields. But what is really amazing is that in the B2 case, uh, actually there is um, construction just because of, the, of this two, because there are two oscillators involved that uh, describes conformal fields in four dimensions. And actually, the theory becomes consistent if uh, it, it is supersymmetric and if n is four or larger. Well, for this system with infinitely many of massless fields, n can be larger than four. four. But if you break down these higher spin symmetries, then the only option that survives is just n equal four super young mills. So somehow this construction uh, indicates that in the B2 context, indeed, there is a kind of duality with n equal to four super young mills, which is the original uh, Maldacena example and most important problem. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of my slide. So the last comment is that it would be, of course, extremely interesting to see whether or not one can now break higher spin symmetries. And I think that this has a good chance to be doable. One can simply let some of the fields carry non-zero vacuum expectation values such that this break down higher spin symmetries because of the presence of Y here. Uh, and at uh, uh, the same time, keeping space-time symmetries unbroken. So this is work in progress. I hope that it will uh, allow to get higher spin symmetries broken, and at the same time, allow, will allow to uh, higher spin fields to get masses. By the way, there were theorems recently by Kamar Gwotsky, Zhubayedov, and some others, uh, saying that if there is a massive higher spin theory, then it's at least a string theory, let's say. So that's if this, indeed, project will be realized, then it will probably uh, imply, indeed, just directly that this is a kind of string-like theory. Okay, so let me come to conclusions. So the conclusion is that there, uh, there is a lot of, there is a large class of Oxeter higher spin theories. Well, the main principle that was used in deriving them was just formal consistency, and that was achieved by using the uh, Chernik algebras. Uh, it's actually extremely hard to construct a consistent theory with higher spins. And string theory is one of the very unique examples of that for massive fields. So I don't think that there is a lot more possibilities for doing so. And uh, I believe that this club is uh, indeed very rich. So tensor models uh, look like being natural duals of the rank P Coxeter Hirschman models. And uh, B2 is string-like. OK, so. There are two coupling constants, as I emphasized, and one is kind of stringy coupling constant, another is like Hirschman coupling constant. Their role remains to be understood. So now I'm coming back to this issue of in how many dimensions we are. So when one considers states in this system, so one can distinguish between uh, some elementary states, multiparticle states, and so on and so forth. But the point is that multiparticle states of a lower dimensional model can be interpreted as elementary states in a higher dimensional models in this setup. That is related to the comment I made on the uh, holography in the context of this unfolded machinery. So that becomes rather explicit. So it, it looks like that, uh, in fact, if one wants to have a picture in terms of usual space time, that somehow the maximal dimension has become, really becomes 10. That was realized not in this paper at all. It was realized like 10 years ago in very different studies that when playing with these uh, twister-like constructions for higher spins, somehow 10-dimensional space is the maximal where uh, 
usual space-time symmetries show up. And uh, uh, from that perspective, these models can be treated as models which live in 10-dimensional theory, but may contain some three-dimensional, well, lower-dimensional brains uh, embedded in this theory, or other way around, it can be considered as a, somehow a composition of three-dimensional higher spin models as an elementary uh, brick from which everything else is composed. Uh, also, just as a final comment, there is a different class of higher spin models which are formulated in any dimension, not in lower dimensional, not in twister terms, and the optimal construction can, of course, be applied to those models as well. Thank you very much. Is it known if any of these models, um, either the original ones or the B2, have consistent truncations with some finite number of actual degrees of freedom, actual fields? Uh, no, I don't think they have any finite uh, uh, truncation. Even the original higher spin theory has no truncation like this. Uh, let me explain why. That's, uh, sometimes people think that, for instance, one can truncate this theory to gravity, for instance. But this is not true because Spin 2 produces sources for higher spin fields. So basically, they all source each other. So there is no truncation like this. Well, I mean, the truncation doesn't have to just be that you turn off the other fields. Yes. I mean, it could be the other fields are some function of the graviton, for example, if that's the one you, you kept, so that you would still get a finite number of degrees of freedom. I mean, you would expect in... In, in string theory, for example, in string field theory, there, there should exist such truncations. They may be quite complicated depending on your choice of variables so that the, the higher spin fields may not be set to zero in them, as, but they may be set to some function of, let's say, the, the metric or something. Is that plausible or...? Well, for particular solutions, this is what sometimes happens. For instance, this is something similar happens to uh, black hole-like solutions that we were studying. So basically, all higher spin pattern in those solutions is built of the uh, spin two. But this, what we know, is for particular solutions. I wouldn't say that for general spin two field, I, I could reconstruct higher spin fields. That's at least I, no, I'm not aware of. Okay, so. I had a question. So, why do Cherenik algebra show up in this context? As you, as you said, uh, they are usually show up in this Calajero Moser kind of systems. Is there some relation between that and the higher spin? Or what is the. It's a good question. They, they, they formally, they, I mean, they, they show up just because they are consistent deformation of the usual oscillator algebra. And there is a list of such deformation is very, very limited for n body problem and mm -hmm. n oscillators. Mm -hmm. Two body problem, of course, you can do a lot. So that's what, uh, from the higher spin perspective, this means that what we, we want to, to, to have, we want to have a consistent system of equations. Consistency essentially means the following is that if I would go, well, uh, uh, what, 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 what consistency is of higher spin equations? Let me explain. Here is the equation, S star S. Star is associative star product. Mm -hmm. So we should check that multiplying by s from the left and multiplying from s from the right and subtracting, we will get zero. So this deformation really satisfies this condition. And this is what is special for Chernik algebra, if you like, and is very hard to achieve otherwise. So that's formally algebraically, this is why they play a role. Uh, there are many interpretations of these terms, by the way, and probably of Chirinic algebra on its own right. This is kind of the ramp homology in the twister space. Uh, that is really very deep structure. What is the relation with Calogero model? It's a good question, actually. I mean, probably there is a rather direct relation with the Calogero model as well. Uh, by the way, uh, actually, the, 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 there is a way probably to make it rather... Um, Direct. Again, playing this game with uh, playing with the number of dimensions. Uh, for instance, 
So that probably will help to understand the relation with the models uh, considered so far. Let me look at this equation, this one. Let me reduce all space-time coordinates to time. Then it will become a kind of Schrodinger equation with respect, non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, but with respect to twister variables. This is just harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator is how the ADS space is represented in these terms. But now you can play a game by letting this de Chernik deformation to these oscillators. You will get actually the uh, collateral-like quantum mechanics which is in some sense dual to this cherrytnik hashman theory in a rather straightforward way. There is such a duality. People realized some time ago that Hirschman algebras are nothing else as just usual symmetries of the Schrodinger equations. They're just well, modular normalization and things like this. The way you, the Cherenik uh, algebra appears here, so to, it's like to every position operator, you up, uh, you also have an oscillator label. Uh, is that yes. right? yeah. yeah? So, so is that like you know, like every one of these collagen Mosa particles also have oscillator oscillators associated with it? Or? Yeah, but they are. Yeah, yeah. That's well. Um, it, it is most convenient to talk about to think about collagen model as collagen model in harmonic potential. Mm -hmm. so if you have harmonic potential, then these are precisely those oscillators that I have introduced that solve explicitly. Give you the spectrum, the wave, wave functions, and everything. There's also uh, a matrix model way of thinking about Calajero Moser. Like, anyway, the, but is that, uh, does that have any uh, applications here? Well, may well be. I, I'm, I'm, um, well, again, I mean, all this non commutative structure is somehow similar to matrix models. If you consider somewhat, you can take away the, 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 the space-time coordinates completely, actually. And that will be some matrix-like model, but infinite dimensional one. Uh, which means that, I mean, the Weyl algebra is basically the, the algebra of infinite dimensional matrices, if you like. What I what I mentioned when I was discussing with Matthias, that there are some special points in the space of, of coupling constants where some reductions can occur. Actually, in the simplest higher spin algebra associated with the three-dimensional usual higher spin theory, we know that for special values of precisely this, uh, this coupling constant, which depending on normalization, in my normalization, they are uh, odd integers. So for special values of this coupling constant nu, then the algebra truncates to usual matrix algebra of uh, dimension related to the, the, this integer that is related that uh, where it truncation occurs. So in that particular cases, that may well be that this system is just becomes usual matrix kind of system. And n to infinity limit for matrices is a kind of new to infinity limit, this coupling constant to infinity limit in this setup. So, I mean, that uh, sounds very interesting, let's say. I wouldn't say it has been studied. Yeah. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Vasilev again. We break for today. <laughs>